thanks so much, Kelly. And also, it is day two in the missing sister murder trial. That's where Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae is in Arizona covering the case against 75-year-old Michael Turney. Julia? That's right, Chanley. Things are actually heating up a bit inside of that courtroom. The prosecutor, when he had Sarah Turney under direct examination, he's pretty straightforward, pretty even volume there in the courtroom. But defense attorney Jamie Jackson hasn't been holding back punches. He has been pretty intense in his cross-examination of the sister. He has questioned her motives, questioned her memory of things that happened back in 2001. But back to that direct examination, we got about an hour more of it today from Vince Bordino asking those questions of Sarah. He asked her about that note that was left behind. We were able to see a picture of it inside of the courtroom. These jurors able to see it and the words that were written on it where allegedly Alyssa said that she was going to run away, that she was going to take money from her father and that she wouldn't be back and that she knew that they didn't want her there. Even saying that Sarah should be happy that she was leaving. Now the prosecution has said even though this is a pretty big hurdle for them in their case that they don't know the time period that this was written under what circumstances it was written and Sarah also said that her sister often wrote her name with a lowercase a not a capital a that you see signed in that letter but she was also asked about whether or not her father ever told her exactly what happened and there's a confession that she claimed is a confession that she recorded take a listen to that moment under direct have you on occasion asked your father uh, what happened to Alyssa? Many times. Has he ever given you an answer? He told me he'd tell me on his deathbed. And when did he make that statement? I met up with him at a Starbucks in October of 2017 to meet him face to face and finally get some answers. Again, jurors haven't heard that recording. They may not because it may not be admissible under the rules of evidence. So they are only hearing what Sarah has to say about that conversation. Now, I noticed she didn't make any eye contact with her father there inside of the courtroom. Here's a look at him, not only now, but back in 2020 when he uh, was appearing in court for his initial appearance, a bit different than what we see inside of the courtroom now. Someone who is seemingly wheelchair bound and he's wearing a hearing device in terms of what he can listen to inside of the courtroom, but he does stand when the jury comes. That cross-examination by his attorney was intense and it focused largely in part on some of the problems that Alyssa was facing while she was living inside of the home. The convenient the things that you remember and don't. Objection, argumentative. Sustained. You gave an example when she was with friends that she would get into cars with strangers to go to parties even though her friends didn't want to. Is that something that you told Detective Anderson? That's what I was told, yes. You said that Alyssa was trusting to a fault. I would consider her extremely trusting, yes. You said that she had difficulty foreseeing the consequences of her actions. Yes, I'm sure. You told Detective Anderson that she would give her phone number and addresses to strangers. That's what I was told. That's what you told Detective Anderson, correct? Yes. That cross-examination wrapped up. Redirect is going on now. And Chanley can tell you, under that cross, she kept her composure. She was cool the entire time. Well, thank you so much, Julia J, for all of those excellent insights and that recap. We'll let you get back inside that courtroom. Uh, joining me this hour, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Brian Gaither and in Los Angeles County Deputy Public Defender Philip Dubay. Hello, gentlemen. Thanks for being with me this hour. Let's talk about the Sarah attorney uh, testimony here. Philip, I'll start with you on um, how much of a, a witness she is for prosecutors. She's super important. She's really bringing her sister to life inside the courtroom, but also addressing some critical points uh, that the defense may argue here about the letter, the possibility she ran away um, at this time. How do you think it's going? Well, first of all, I think the, the sister is holding her own. Every effort that defense counsel makes to try to rile the girl kind of backfires. If anything, her answers rile him. 
you know? So she's very poised, calm, and just a good witness for the prosecution. The only problem is, I just don't think that the probative value, if any, of her testimony moves the needle toward guilt, frankly. Uh, and she leaves open the possibility that many other things could have happened to this girl. So for example, she could have been a runaway, you know? Or maybe she was abducted by somebody else. Or maybe she is not a runaway, she just checked out, she didn't want to have anything to do with the family anymore, or her sister. This sister who is now testifying is coming back in time, or forward if you will, and reaching back in time to a relationship does, does, does not sound as if it was as honky-dory as she made out to the police. And now on cross-examination, it appears that these two sisters were not as close and as loving as she says now, that they were in fact a little, I don't want to go as far uh, as to say that they were estranged, but they certainly were not close, loving siblings. Right. I mean, kind of sounds like, Brian, typical sibling <laughs> behavior, teenager-type behavior. At the time, Sarah was 12, I believe, and then her sister, mm. Alyssa, was 17. You know, uh, t you know, teenager who was a bit rebellious at that age and had to live with a stepfather who wasn't really nice to her, Brian. Yeah, of course. Um you know, I have an older brother, I have a younger sister too. So, you know, we have our ups and downs, goods and bads. And, you know, it, it wasn't anything that was just too shocking. But um, like like uh, counsel was saying, the thing is the state, she's a great witness because her composure, but she doesn't really have too much probative information as far as evidence to move this needle forward. Because remember, it's still up to the, to the prosecution to prove everything. So. Mm -hmm. I understand why the prosecution wants to bring in a note and just get out of get out the way their bad evidence, but you still have to prove that. You you have to prove that um it was she was actually murdered, that you know, you have a body and everything. Mm -hmm. The biggest piece of evidence that they potentially have for the defense with her is that statement that she said that the father was like he would tell you tell her what happened on his deathbed. Now, if there's a recording and they can push that, that is the actual probative evidence that would push it forward. But outside of that, it's really, like I said, she's 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 whole staying in her ground, but it's really not a, enough probative evidence to to, to right. prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. We are missing some evidence here, Philip DeBay. I know it's still early on. This is just witness number two for prosecutors in their case in chief. But here, like Brian said, there's no body. Uh, there's this letter that uh, Julia just showed us that's in the penmanship of the victim here, alleged victim here, uh, that ran away. Uh, that's something the prosecution's going to have to overcome. And, you know, we have some allegations uh, from prosecutors about uh, the father, stepfather sexually abusing uh, the daughter, but that's through, you know, word of mouth that she told. It's a difficult case for prosecutors, Philip. Absolutely it is. They just do not have the smoking gun. What I was hoping is that they would introduce some type of a statement through the hearsay exception, uh, commonly referred to now as the forfeiture by wrongdoing, where a missing stepdaughter says to third parties out there, if anything happens to me, look to my stepdad because I am confident he's going to try to harm me or kill me. Those are some of the worst type of, types of statements to come into evidence because you can't really cross-examine on it, you know? Uh, but other than that, you know, you know, if they don't play that quote unquote recorded statement from that coffee house, you're asking a jury to guess and to speculate what, if anything, he was going to say to her on his deathbed. And frankly, I don't think the judge should let it in because you're just floating the idea based on innuendo that maybe he confessed. And you never know what a jury might do. They might say, well, you know, if maybe he confessed, that's good enough for me. Let's find him guilty. That's, that's a good point, and there's also some other incriminating actions or inactions around the time of her disappearance. So we'll see what the prosecution does, building their case step by step and painting a picture of circumstantial evidence.